Introductions first off, my name is Anne McElvoy, I'm senior editor at The Economist, I specialise in policy and I write a lot about education and I, I'm very intrigued to do a session on MOOCs because every time I have a piece about MOOCs in The Economist, half of my colleagues think it doesn't go far enough and the other half think it's overhyped. And I think that gives us a very interesting discussion for today where we'll look at where we think the MOOC is, but also how it can be adapted and how its platforms, its business model and anything else our illustrious panel would like to discuss, think it will change and adapt, particularly perhaps to move it out of that higher education ghetto and into the broader debate about education uh, and K to 12. So uh, let me tell you who your panel are. Um, I'm hoping I get this uh, reshuffled order right. Next to me is Jim. Jim Shelton, who's former Deputy Secretary of Education in the US um, and very well known for his work in scaling innovation. He's also uh, looked after very, very large projects and budgets for the Gates Foundation, which is the best case of putting someone else's money where your mouth is, I think. Um, so you can tell us a bit about that, perhaps, as we go along, Jim. Next to Jim is Suleiman Kachani, Vice Provost of Columbia University, also in the US, of course, with a particular interest in developing teaching and learning strategies online and how they will develop in the higher education space and possibly also beyond Suleiman. Yeah? Uh, Nero Kosler, next to Suleiman, is co founder, executive director of CK12 Foundation, a non profit specializing in spreading science and maths products into K 12. Kathy Kavana is Teaching and Learning Director for Microsoft in the US and has many years before that uh, in this sector and has watched it develop for, for some time. So I'd be interested perhaps on, uh, on, on getting your thoughts about that and the tension between the speed of innovation and what we need to keep sort of checking on as we go along, Kathy. Uh, Tom Hatton is CEO of RefMe, a UK-based company. It's a digital citation platform which apparently is going to take all the work uh, out of research for those of us who are, have a ready excuse of not doing our next great piece of research or book because the citations are such a nightmare to, uh, to check up and, and find. And uh, Tom's, uh, Tom's work is very much addressing that. It already has massive take up of students in the UK. It's one of the fastest growing ed tech companies in Europe. So what I think we should do is let our panel get things off their chest for five minutes about where they think we are with the MOOC. I'm just going to read them and read you um, just a little prophecy, which was from Robert Groves, the provost of Georgetown University in 2012. The ability of massive open online courses to deliver exactly the same experience simultaneously to thousands of students breaks the mold of traditional university education. We can all see their potential to increase access to education and reduce the costs of education. Uh, as I indicated earlier, some people will see that as a, a prophecy being fulfilled and others will have raised doubts about pedagogy, business model, well, doubts about everything. In education, there's always doubts about everything. So I would really like to start by asking my panel, five minutes each, please, panel, on whether you see hype or potential when you look at the MOOC. Jim, would you kick us off? Um, so I think that what has happened is that we started off with both tremendous potential and tremendous hype, that the, um, glossy, gl the glossiness has come off of MOOCs in terms of what they actually are actually able to deliver in terms of transformative change. But um, the reality is that they have done a little bit of both. And here's what I mean by that. Like they literally lived up to their name, right? Massive online open courses. So we did see the advent of thousands of young of students taking advantage of learning opportunities that previously would have been reserved for a very small number of folks. Um, people who were able to demonstrate that they had learned something um, from all parts of the world. And so you had this access point from two different fronts. One is access to learning opportunities that they wouldn't have had access to. Two is visibility and the talent that people didn't realize was out there in different parts of the world where people were able to demonstrate that they could outperform students at some of the most elite institutions in the world. The next thing is that one of the things that we saw is that these platforms are probably the largest platforms for learning about learning, learning about learning that exist. Um, that's still a potential platform for doing so. But we now have the opportunity to not only see the outcome of learning, but to see the process of learning as students participate in this work. Um, that has got tremendous potential for accelerating the pace at which we can innovate in education. 
The third thing that started to happen is that as MOOCs evolved, you start to see communities both in the real world and the virtual world form around them. And the smartest folks in the MOOC business began to understand that this was not just a byproduct, but actually could be core, not only to what the MOOC is, but also to, frankly, the savior of MOOCs on the instructional side. Um, and so you saw people developing tools and resources to help people both independently and in groups work better together. Um, that was actually a really important insight, and I think we're gonna see it going forward as people begin to focus on learning. But here's the challenge. The challenge is that there are still a number of barriers to MOOCs really being transformative. The first thing is that the value of MOOCs, either instructionally or economically, has not been proven. Um, that many of the colleges even that actually create them don't actually recognize them for credit. Um, employers haven't seen them put together in packages that actually are valuable to them in ways that they see uh, that they are willing to give credit for them as employees. Um, we don't actually, um, haven't seen the kind of outcomes that we'd like to see from MOOCs. We still see tremendous amount of attrition through many of them. Um, and even for the people who do complete, there is still a question, whether valid or not, about the depth of learning that the students actually have a, about the core content area. When you put all of that together, what it says is that there are a number of things that need to happen for us to, to begin to establish MOOCs as a permanent fixture that has a potential, to, can realize its potential for transformation. The first is we have to figure out the validation question. How are we going to validate the learning that comes from MOOCs? Um, and how are we going to put a either academic or economic value on that? The second is we need to accelerate the pace at which we're doing R&D on how you actually deliver effective education and learning through the MOOC platform. Um, that needs to happen much more quickly than it's happened. And then distinct from that, is MOOCs, as I said before, provide us with a unique opportunity, a new, unique platform for doing research and learning about learning in a way we've never done before. So we need new methodologies and innovation in that space as well. And the, the better we get at that, the more quickly it will happen on the other front. And then finally, um, one of the things that needs to remain true is the open theory, the principle of openness needs to be maintained in the MOOC space so that we can rapidly scale those things that we learn work. Um, and that's both in terms of tools and resources and approaches as well as, um, you know, in some of the things around instructional strategy. Um, so a lot there, but that's where I think things are. So you think it's basically a job half done? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Great. Well, why don't you, sort of, you take that on? I mean, there you are sitting at Columbia, powerhouse of of ideas, but also you know, a, a go-ahead university in terms of how it wants people to access what it offers. How much do you think the MOOC has opened up for you and what has it still got to do? Sure. Uh, thank you, Anne. And uh, just to build on what Jim mentioned, I, I, I would like first to start by saying that uh, universities like Columbia did not start working on online education with the advent of the MOOCs. Uh, since, at Columbia since 1986, we have been running very successful distance education programs that went fully in online 1998. What the MOOCs or MOOC revolution or tsunami, like others have called it, has done is actually to question the effectiveness of traditional approaches to education, uh, primarily large classrooms with very passive learning. And what faculty committees at Columbia and uh, all over the US and the world have done trying to make sense of MOOCs and trying to develop an online education strategy for universities is to look at the value of innovation and experimentation with new um, approaches to pedagogy and use of instructional technology. And we're talking here about adaptive learning uh, hybrid learning, flipping classrooms, experiential learning, peer-based learning, competency-based learning, and I can go on and on. And the reason why universities like Columbia engaged in offering MOOCs, uh, and we are the only university actually that's both a Coursera and edX partner, is that is actually three things that became four more recently. The first one is a desire to share knowledge with the world, reaching out learners all over the world who would otherwise not be able to have access to quality education. 
The second reason was how can we learn from our experience with the MOOCs, from these innovations and experimentations with pedagogy and technology to improve teaching and learning on campus. And the big myth about research universities is that we place a huge premium on teaching on campus. And fortunately, the reality is that research universities put a lot of emphasis on research. And what the conversation about MOOCs has enabled us to do is actually to start talking about teaching and learning mm -hmm. as an important component of what we do and the fact we cannot hide anymore bad teachers. We need to provide better professional development, particularly for junior faculty, for teaching assistants, and we have to experiment with new pedagogy and with new technology to enhance that teaching and learning. I'm not saying we are going to flip all our courses and mookify all our courses. In fact, based on the type of course, the size of the course, and the, and the, the discipline, courses may lend themselves to full flipping or partial flipping or no flipping at all. But the idea is how can we assess and evaluate those different innovations and, 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 and actually um, improve the, the, the outcomes of our students. The, the third reason why universities engage in MOOCs was to showcase, some, of, some people may call it branding, but showcase faculty programs and departments and not merely to draw applicants because we have enough, yeah. but actually just enhancing the reputation of the universities. Now, as we have been talking about sustainable models for MOOCs, a fourth argument has come into play, I would say in the past six months, and Columbia is not the only university that has been talking about this, is instead of adopting a fairly arrogant approach of saying we are going to teach the world, which may be true for specific disciplines when you're talking about specializing in technology, in engineering, or in business. How can we build MOOCs that from the get-go link our students to a global audience of not only learners, but also experts on big topics? So that it's actually two-way learning. <coughs> and topics like sustainability, like in energy, like freedom of expression, like global terrorism, those are topics that actually can be modeled into courses that can engage our students on campus with activists, with NGOs, with governments, as well as learners all over the world, and build communities that transcend the MOOC. And the MOOC becomes just the starting point. And going back to uh, your point, Jim, is actually that type of community uh, is actually extremely valuable, and we'll see more of that uh, happening with time. Yeah, that's a very interesting example of an elasticity that's perhaps coming to the argument about MOOCs when we started out thinking and writing about was much more the model of so-called Harvard on a plate of glass, wasn't it? We sort of served out to the rest of the world. I thought that was, uh, was very interesting. We might well come back to that uh, reciprocity. Um, now, Nehru, as a founder, director of CK12, and obviously you're, you're focused on that space. Does this all sound to you a bit like something, an ill-fitted model from higher education that you have to somehow talk about today? Or do you see a potential for you that uses aspects of the MOOC, but perhaps also helps develop it in your space? Well, I'm glad you said change the, you know, the, the discussion for my aspect, because for me, in the K-12 space, MOOCs just don't work, primarily because young kids, particularly very young kids, just cannot stitch knowledge together, okay? So when you think about when we start teaching students about motion, what does, you know, motion move has, uh, way things move, and when they move, there's a speed to which, uh, which would they move, and that's called velocity, and will change in velocity become, becomes acceleration. Those things are things that we have to lead students through. Now, MOOCs can do that, but they can't tell whether little younger kids can actually uh, make that uh, differentiation. And, and, not, and children have this, younger learners have this uh, um, ability to ignore what they don't want to learn. So sometimes you just have to force them into learning some of these things. 
And so the MOOC format in the present format uh, is kind of dangerous for that, that aspect of learning. Um, I actually talked to uh, the founder of Udacity and I said, hey, uh, Sebastian Perrin, how are things going? He says, well, the MOOCs are dead and, and, and in the present form. And to some extent, you know, that's what's happened as a student. And I, you know, I have probably enrolled in about 10 MOOCs. How many have you finished? I'm, I'm glad you asked. None. <laughs> I didn't finish because I, I don't have to. But, you know, friends of mine who do take MOOCs say, hey, I'm taking a MOOC at MIT. And, girl, you know, kids I know in India and outside U.S. are saying, I am taking a class at MIT, and they feel really good about that. Whether they complete that or not is another matter. And we, we, we alluded to all that, you know, Jim said some of that, and um, so Alman, uh, um, sorry, Solman said that too. Um, so there's a, MOOCs are the first generation innovation. And, and we know that first generation innovation doesn't necessarily work. It's very rare that something might work. So it's, it's actually, I'm actually more excited about what might happen in the next generations. And some of that work we're doing ourselves, we don't call ourselves MOOCs, but we call ourselves, you know, some of the needed, the knowledge pathways uh, are very, very important for young kids. And, Actually, not just, just young kids. I think there has to be a continuum that has to be kind of stitched together from K to 12 to 16 and onward. Um, <clears throat> and, and the rules change. Um, so that's one thing you know, I really think doesn't work. On the other hand, what does work for K-12 is professional development for teachers. That itself could be very, very valuable. And I know that you know, there have been many, many um, Joe Bowler at Stanford has a MOOC that teaches, um, teaches how to do, uh, teach younger kids. That kind of scenario is actually very, very useful. And I'm looking forward to what might happen um, and how might we motivate younger kids uh, maybe with a slightly different model. So, so that's, that leaves us um, a very interesting point as, as Kathy uh, joins the, the, the discussion. Sebastian Thron there sort of quoted as, as saying the MOOC, or at least the Ur MOOC, is dead. Or is it like Monty Python's parrot just resting? And the answer to that and how you perceive it, Kathy, must be of great interest to, to a company like Microsoft because the potential sounds so huge and yet we know what the, the initial kind of constraints or worries about what it can deliver are. Where do you come out on that? Well, I'm glad that uh, Nehru mentioned um, that if they do something like a MOOC, they don't necessarily call it a MOOC. Um, and I think we're reaching a point where, as Soliman mentioned, there are many, many, many approaches to teaching and learning, many of which involve technology. We, we have names for them now so that we can differentiate them, but I think very soon we won't be calling it online learning or classroom learning. It'll be learning, and it'll involve any number of, of tools. It'll be very fluid. Um, so I like that, that notion of flu, flu, fluidity. Um, and I think that one of the great successes of the MOOC has been to show us the fluidity of, of learning and the fluidity of needs. Um, I, I recall a couple of examples of students who made amazing use of MOOCs no one would have expected. There was the, um, the teenager in uh, Mongolia who was the, the highest scoring um, student in a very demanding MOOC. Um, it, at Microsoft, we have um, technical certifications, and one of the youngest students to achieve one of our technical certifications was five. So <laughs> that student should be allowed to join any MOOC he wants and um, go as far as, as he wants. It, I think it's not for us to say what that student needs. Um, so I think MOOCs have opened up opportunity um, for people who haven't had that opportunity. Um, so that's, that's one of the great um, successes of the MOOC. Um, I think one of the great hopes of the MOOC, um, as Jim mentioned, was um, allowing us to better understand teaching and learning. 
So we've got amazing data now in every MOOC that's ever been offered. And people are beginning to now go in and mine that data and, and see what that means. And MOOCs have shifted our focus to teaching and learning. And I think as we think about the next generation or the funding model, the business model of MOOCs, we don't define them necessarily as a course and something that's going, that's, that's created solely to advance academic progress, but we think about them maybe as partly part of the academic pathway that student might need to, to know whether they're prepared to explore a content area, to know whether that's what they want. Partly a MOOC can be marketing, but primarily a MOOC needs to be defined as faculty development and research. So I think that the primary value that an institution, whether it's K-12 or higher education, gets from something like a MOOC um, is that learning and that development of skills in designing instruction and in delivering instruction, uh, doing the collaboration, doing the communication, doing all the facilitation that we know translates to higher levels of completion. And so we're just now starting to, to touch that space and, and kind of dip into that ocean with the, the new visibility tools that we have, looking with the data, what the data tell us, what they tell us about instructors, what they tell us about content, what they tell us about time and place, uh, what they tell us about sequence, what they tell us about learners and learner characteristics. Um, so that to me is the great hope um, and that's what I see coming ahead of us. Very quick word on completion panel. You might like to hold this thought to come back to there are two views of it, really, aren't there? One is that it doesn't matter, a MOOC's like a book, how many books have you got at home you haven't finished? Rather more than we might like to admit. But and yet, somehow, we keep coming back to this nagging question, and Jim also mentioned it. Uh, if you could just, you know, please keep that in your heads, because I'd love to hear from you, but we should just get around the panel. Completion, how much does it keep you up at night? Completion is the goal of the developer, not the goal of the student. I think that the goal mm -hmm. of the student is what's most important. <coughs> Right, okay, we might come back to that. Now, uh, Tom, something that you're doing where you've clearly spotted a need and spotted a gap and gone right into it with a, a new product, does that seem to you to be linked to this big discussion about the MOOCs, or do you feel that, in a way, you've gone off on, you know, into a different avenue or a side road from, from that discussion? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, um, look, MOOCs are brilliant. There's... Um, there's around sort of two billion kids who don't have access to sort of university level education because uh, they can't afford it. And being able to open up education on that level is just amazing. What's happened though is they've not thought about pretty much you know, fundamentals in building technology, things like the user experience, the actual, uh, you know, making these things credible. Um, there's, you know, there's a reason why Wikipedia is the sixth most visited website in the world. It's because people want to go and access information constantly. But when you put, sort of bundle this information up and put it in a platform that you know, might, be, might take four days to download, uh, might be completely sort of uh, incompatible on an iPad or something, um, it changes the complete sort of experience of learning. Uh, this is something that like, the, the publishers have discovered. They all put their content and threw it onto an iPad and write, right, job done. You know, we're, we're an e-publisher, um, which just isn't the case, right? Um, and I think it's the same with MOOCs. MOOCs need to adapt to this really young, savvy, tech-savvy sort of... Um, they are expecting an incredible experience. Um, you know, for MOOCs to become incredible, they need to be incredible first. Um, and I think that's sort of really important sort of from a product side. Mm. The content's fantastic, you know, it really is great. Um, but I also think there, within the content, there's a slight issue with what people have been given to learn. Um, what kind of issue? Can you put your finger on it? So, so, so I, I mean, like, I went to university and I studied history of art and music and I run a tech company. You know, it makes no sense. Um, but actually... There's, a, there's millions of parents yeah. around the world hugely relieved to hear that when their kids yeah. go off to do that humanities degree and they're thinking, oh, why hasn't he gone off to do a tech subject? But, but you're a good example of... The, the reason I went to university ability. was to get a job. And I think that's exactly what a MOOC should offer. You know, that's exactly where Google, Facebook, Microsoft have been doing it with their certificates. That's what you should get by achieving a MOOC. You know, it's a great tool to recruit people, essentially. Um, <laughs> instead of just getting a, you know, a, a badge, an award, you know, it, it needs to be meaningful, and then people will complete these, these courses. I'd just love to know from the audience, how many people have done a MOOC in the audience? 
It's all right. You, <coughs> won't, you won't be tested on it later. Let's look at a fair sprinkling. How many people finished their MOOC course? Um, Some. Actually, they're very, a very creditable sample. <laughs> I would guess about half in this audience. That might be rather more than, uh, than yeah. outside this building. And like a typical journalist, I signed up for a lot. Now they keep asking me for fi <coughs> feedback. And I wonder if it's fair to give feedback if you only, you only completed about two of the, the sections. Jim, you were nodding there at that, that last point. What was, what was going through your mind? So as I said, the, the, the MOOCs need to establish their value both in terms of um, their validity around the educational outcome, but their value economically. Um, and one of the ways in which we might want to think about this is in the areas of, of technical certifications, there's already broad established standards that then, you know, people can go through these uh, MOOC experiences and then we determine whether or not they can actually perform at a level that would let them get a job, um, realize real economic value. Once employers start to be indifferent to the pathway that people take um, and you have high quality courses that can guarantee that path for them, MOOCs in and of themselves will begin to increase in value. The investment in MOOCs will begin to increase. And you'll start to see the flywheel turn on the quality of MOOCs and all the other things that go along with it. Um, the, just, just really quick, I wanted to say, on the, on the question of completion, um, I think that there is a point that, you know, different people are signing up for MOOCs for different reasons. But if the question is, will MOOCs ultimately disrupt our standard form of traditional education in any meaningful way, then the question of starting and completion has got to be addressed. The vast majority of folks are not just uh, autodidactics. Yes. And so um, if it's going to deliver real value, then it has to be able to deliver value for most of the people that try it. Who else would like to come in on that? So one, one thing that goes through my mind is, you know, the lecture, the lecture format doesn't work, yeah. right? We know that. What dared us to think that if you put lectures online, that that would work? No, it's, it's seriously. A, it, it is a very good point. I mean, right. so someone no. said to me, I was researching MOOCs recently, that you'd basically taken the worst possible method of pedagogically, and then sort of thought that putting it on a, a sort of tech platform would work. Do you sure. think that's fair to the main, or well, is that a bit of a caricature? I'm going to play devil's advocate. You're looking <laughs> outraged. Just to be, no, 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 I'm not outraged. I'll just say, first of all, the, the issue of completion doesn't keep us uh, up at night, just to answer your question. Anne, um, I convinced a number of faculty very on to, to teach MOOCs. And, you know, two, uh, two departmental colleagues I taught a MOOC on financial engineering and risk management, uh, the first MOOC of Columbia on Coursera. They had 85,000 students. 10% uh, completed the course and got a passing grade. That's 8,500 students. That's more than the number of students that these two colleagues will teach in their life on campus. Another 10% of the, of the learners completed watched all the videos and completed the assignments, but did not take the exams. That's what you would call in a classroom setting auditors. So with those numbers, and given the scale, I don't think the issue here is uh, completion. Actually, I think the issue, which Coursera and edX have done a really good job of capturing the analytics about, is how many people meaningfully start the course. And that number is significantly lower than the people who sign up a month or two months before the start of the course. But if your yardstick is how many people will watch the first video and complete the first assignment, the erosion after that is not actually high. Do you have a stat on that? Roughly? Yeah, so, so, ba so basically, uh, depending on the field, because it's discipline-based, um, there is basically, sorry, there is a funnel and you lose 50% at each point. But if, if they complete the first uh, assignment, typically about one third of them will complete the course, which is a fairly good percentage if you think about it. Now, in terms of the worst format, I agree that talking heads is not necessarily the best way of teaching. And I, I disagree in the sense that most MOOCs actually are low quality, low touch productions with pretty much no learning objects, just a talking head 
with a slide. That's not true of all the MOOCs. So typically a MOOC, I'm giving you insider information, costs 50 to 100K to produce and pretty much all universities in the US have adopted the stance that there would not be any additional compensation for faculty for teaching MOOCs. Now, not everybody produces a MOOC at 50 to 100K. There are many stories of 250, 500K, and so it's an arms race like you're producing a movie, and the more resources you throw at the MOOC, the, be the better it looks. And for those MOOCs, the production value, the quality, the thought, the learning objects that you create, the adaptivity of the course, those are key ingredients to make this effective. And some of these courses that are in a MOOC format do actually work. Kathy, I don't know if you'd like to come in off the back of that, but it, that does raise some interesting questions about the business model, doesn't it? If uh, that, that's rather fascinating, those upper end figures surprised me. Actually, I, I thought the sort of 100k was about the the top end of, of the cost of producing a MOOC. But if it's actually going to move towards being kind of half a million to produce a MOOC, well, that it sort of doesn't sound quite like the original idea. Is that something that, that you see challenging the whole underpinning the, the business case of the MOOC? Uh, I think the price depends on the model. Right? There, there's no one uniform model of a MOOC. Um, I think if you look back at the original um, proposal, Downs and Seaman, and they proposed the, the, the C-MOOC, the collaborative MOOC, and a big part of what their uh, philosophy was and their vision was, was bringing people together. They're all about connectivism, and they felt that a MOOC was a way to connect people who had a common interest and a common goal. Um, so now we've got many flavors of MOOCs. Um, we have the, the ones that are content delivery with some maybe some automated feedback, which is a, a learning experience that, that many people value. Um, there are still some that are more collaborative and communicative and connective, which is a, a highly facilitated model, much different in terms of what the overhead is. Um, and then there are, there are newer flavors. There's a research group who created a MORC, a massively open online research community. So um, we're starting to see some evolution as to what we mean by MOOC. Um, what the potential is, and therefore the purposes and the funding, right? So now we need to think about um, who's creating it and why, um, and then who, who should pay for it and why, what should be the benefit that they get out of it. So it depends on what, what the institution wants, what the individuals want. But there's a freemium model that's starting to, to be applied. There is, but there's also quite a lot of change to, to mm. the model, isn't there, Jim? The whole kind of idea of the, uh, the mass open course does seem to be being challenged uh, as well as some of the iterations you've mentioned. There's also now the, the beginnings of the SPOC, you know, the small private online course, which can open up what a university is doing, but it has to, it's usually, it has, has more criteria or it can be charged for differently. Do you think the idea of the MOOC is really, uh, is now dissipating into the different things that are just happen to be offered in the online space? So I do think that what is happening is that the market is starting to, to segment a little bit. And what you're starting to see is that, um, you know, as was said, there was, this is not the first time we've seen online learning by any stretch of the imagination. Um, there was an introduction of this new form of delivery um, that was a much, much broader, much more open market. But uh, this expectation that we were going to be able to produce things that were going to both produce life-changing outcomes um, and advance innovation in the space, and somehow we were supposed to be able to do that at less than a few hundred thousand dollars a pop. Um, is was probably not well founded. And so the, the question for us is, um, to the question of who should be investing in this, if these things have real value um, and have the potential to teach us more about learning than we can through any individual, <coughs> especially small proprietary platform, then what is the role, and I would say collectively in governments and working together to create an infrastructure that accelerates the pace of their growth that builds tools for both architecture and authoring of these systems and for research and development. And then it lowers the cost for everyone to develop the content um, and people can decide whether they want to take the content and try to create something proprietary and others will decide with very limited resources to continue to invest in creating the best course in the world in a particular area. And I think all of those things are yet to play out. Tom, do you have a quick word on that round? Yeah, I'm, I'm just hearing how much it costs to actually create a MOOC. And I'm sure if, you know, got some kids from Colombia, they'd be able to do it for a couple of thousand dollars. Um, I do believe that a lot of this is because the approach to building the technologies 
is massively overcomplicated, and it's not using the resources that you actually have within these communities. Um, you know, I can I can do a how to do an E major scale and put it on YouTube and get 20 million hits sort of the next day and get feedback on it. And I think we forget that actually this sort of massive these platforms are already kind of happening. You know, people send a tweet and 20 million people get a little piece of a fact and um, maybe not validated, but yeah, the, the fact is these platforms already exist. People are already communicating and educating others on it and reaching huge audiences and people are learning from them. Are you suggesting that the MOOC or that the, the big MOOCsters haven't accessed enough of that pool? Absolutely, sure. yeah. yeah. Speaking of tweeting, I think there's a, a terrible punishment before uh, anyone chairing these panels who doesn't remind everyone, can you please tweet away, because it's great to have our big audience outside this hall in many other countries uh, joining this debate, and this does seem like an ideal subject as well. So Twitter at GES Forum, hashtag GESF. I managed to sneak a tweet in, uh, but I don't think our, our, our panel can, can quite do that while they're talking to you. So if you find something interesting or to contribute or simply disagree loudly, <laughs> Please do. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's definitely something to tweet about over there. Um, let's come back a bit, if we can, to this, how we might move beyond higher education, because, Nero, you did sound... Well, you sounded a little downbeat about the potential of the MOOC, but if you do see spaces where you think... that, it, I mean, you mentioned for teaching and enhancing teaching. So are there things going on out there? Are there things that you're either hoping that you'll be able to get involved in that, that use some of the founding ideas of the MOOC in the K-12 space rather better? Um, okay, so clarification. Um, my nonprofit is a technology company, okay? It's a tech as well as a content. So there's a marriage between the two. And I think MOOCs to do that job that you do in a classroom have to give in real time feedback to the student. And I think that's a missing component. So in our own uh, website, and our own platform, we are actually uh, creating data around usage, what's happening, where are you making mistakes? We've created knowledge pathways that we've created at a very deep level from the day we started nine years ago. We started collecting that information and, and kind of saying, look, this is where you're making a mistake. Pay attention to that. You're not adding two plus two. You're, you know, just, just to make it very simple, give a concrete example. Uh, I think in the present form, and I think maybe a few generations to come, that's going to be very hard for MOOCs to do, the cost. Will each person who's putting this knowledge out there really have that in information? Who you don't think that the advances in adaptive learning, sometimes we tell, you know, typically if I go to a conference, I get a session on adaptive learning and then one on the MOOC, and it does, it's almost like these two things which seem like they should yeah. be feeding off they each should, other. Yes. Tom's point in a different guise right. are, are kind of going into different silos. But, but it isn't, I think, because eventually they will all converge. Okay. Eventually, they have to converge right. yeah. if, they, if online education has to be... The problem is adaptive learning are these big sort of artificial intelligence, machine right. learning type platforms that cost a fortune to make. Uh, and they're not but doing it for free, really. They're, they're there to make money. Whereas a MOOC is, is less sort of inclined to kind of be as this big profitable tech So company. to your mind, the... The free element of the or, the or nearly marginal cost element of the MOOC puts it in a different category. And what chances are there then of sort of bridging those two? They're just waiting to happen. Yeah. It's just waiting, waiting to, to happen. happen, and it will eventually. And then once that sort of magical day goes, then it'll be a fantastic learning platform. Do you see the magical day there, Jim? I, I do, but I, I, given this audience in particular, I just don't see a reason to wait for it to happen. Mm. Uh, there are things that we can do to accelerate the pace at which it happens. There are things that we can do to, we know we need to work through what the algorithms for the adaptive platforms need to look like. It would be very easy to launch a number of prizes around algorithms to improve these adaptive formulas, formulations very, very quickly. With very little money, you could run prizes around the best courses in, pick your area, and have large content, mm -hmm. content areas developed all around the world to actually give many, many different approaches to the very same problems. And then all of a sudden you have lots to plug into these adaptive algorithms that let different people go through different pathways around different lessons. Like these are all things that we could be doing right now 
that would dramatically accelerate the pace at which this convergence happens. And then, who knows which way the market goes? Hmm. Suleiman. Yeah, I, I would just say that the only adaptive learning that is going on in MOOCs right now is everybody is watching the videos at speed 1.5 or 2. <laughs> and there is really not much in terms of thought about a heterogeneous group of students coming to learn the same content. Sorry, I'll take it back. The other thing is to divide the course into sub-pieces and having now shorter and shorter courses so that those students who would be challenged by week four now just take course one, part one, and don't take part two. That is hardly the right way to go when it comes to adaptive learning. Now, when I look at higher education versus K-12, I feel, and going to, uh, to Jim's point, I, I, I think there is something that can be done in K-12 that actually it would not be the same answer to higher education. Let me, let me try to explain that. So when we're talking about higher education, we're looking at outcome-based learning or skill-based or competency-based learning, depending on how you want to, 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 to phrase it, and that is to equip uh, learners with skills that can help them to get a job. Uh, and, and to your point, I agree with you, Tom, with regards to a coding course or an engineering course, uh, the cost I was talking about is about a lot of these courses that actually a history course. The cost of that will be high because of the production value, because of the artifacts, because of the learning objects that you need to do proper teaching of that. The difference between higher education and K-12 is the audience for K-12 is, is the students and the parents. And for the learners to invest the time to actually learn in a, in, an edu in a technology platform, that has to be tied to the national curriculum, to what actually they are, they're doing so that it can improve their performance in class. Mm -hmm. And that is somehow, in many cases, detached from what is the proper way of teaching this. So if you are not relevant to these kids and their parents, in terms of if you use my platform, you'll score better in class, it's very hard to get these users to actually adopt the platform, and that's why it has to be tied to that national curriculum, but you can mookify a national curriculum. You can take K-12 education by subject in modules of five to seven minutes with quizzes, with learning objects, with a modular structure, an adaptive structure, and do it in a way that, and, and the government can play a role, nonprofits can play a role, Unions can but play a role. It's very slow to happen, isn't it, panel? I mean, I, I, I reached a, a, a point of despair with one of my teenagers the other day when I just thought, oh, for heaven's sake, if you don't understand it, let's just find a little, you know. And I looked at Khan Academy and it just didn't happen to be covered. And obviously, I'm talking within the British curriculum, but I'm sure this, you know, I can't believe that American teenagers are entirely different, or indeed those in Dubai or anywhere else. But sometimes you just want that little bit of content thoroughly explained, and then a test afterwards, which would be delivered more competently than I could deliver. And I still found difficulty in finding that product. And I wondered, Kathy, whether, you know, whether that, that sort of space is interesting to you and, and your company. Yep, there, there are a couple of roles of, of MOOCs in K-12 that I would say that we're involved in in some way. Um, so a couple of people mentioned teacher education before, and that ties to Andreas's comment this morning about mm -hmm. the need for, for professional learning, ongoing professional learning, especially collaborative professional learning. And so I think that um, teachers and teacher unions, teacher organizations can certainly share some of the cost of creating great MOOCs because not only will they have an avenue for professional learning and connection with colleagues, but then they will have content that they can use to teach. And so I think that in, in K-12 mm -hmm. itself, there, there have been some K-12 MOOCs mm -hmm. um, kind of informal learning, you know, on the side for, for interest sake. Um, but integrating MOOCs into a K-12 curriculum sounds to me like blended learning, yeah. bringing great yeah. content into a facilitated learning experience, um, whether that's in an online school, a fully face-to-face -face program, a, a strategically blended program, or maybe a homeschool situation. There are many, many um, applications, I think, for, for existing MOOCs and purpose-built MOOCs um, to support K-12 learning. Um, K-12 will probably benefit from the investment that higher education and other investors are able to make. Um, I think in the same way, MOOCs can benefit from the heritage of virtual schooling and the competency-based learning, the mastery-based learning that's come out of the virtual schooling movement, whereby millions of students have um, succeeded in learning online, fully online, 
um, as K-12 students because of the, the very careful balance of the technology, the feedback, and the facilitation that's evolved at those levels. Yeah. Well, it's a good ch a chance to go to the floor, put, put the audience to work. Uh, we'd love some questions from you to spark off some more debate on the panel. Just stick your hand in the air, and I'm sure there's a, a wandering microphone. So we'll sprint to you. Yes, uh, second row, the gentleman here, I can see. And anyone further back, just wave. Just do introduce yourself so we know who you are. Hi, I'm uh, Mike Rosenberg. I'm based in the UK and run a company that makes solar computers, uh, some of which were used for a distance learning project in Ghana, so MOOCs at a much smaller scale and in, in real time. My, my question's for the panel, but um, it refers to Jim's comments that with private sector employers, there is a, a, a lack of sort of recognition of MOOC courses. And I recently saw a sort of choose your own adventure video that PricewaterhouseCoopers had done for their incoming class, so teaching role-playing, talking through situations. I wonder if you've seen any examples of corporates releasing their own sort of MOOC-style content yeah. mm -hmm. with a view that this could help yeah. uh, identify skills. Mm -hmm. And then I had a, just a quick question for Solomon, which is you mentioned that some disciplines benefit from a fully flipped or partially flipped or, a, or they, they wouldn't uh, be rec you know, relevant for flipping. Are there any sort of um, specific examples of disciplines that work really well as a flipped model mm -hmm. versus partially flipped? All right, let, let, let's take flippability first, for a minute, and then we'll make back, back to your first question. So, uh, the, the best answer to your question is ask me in a year. So, but I'll, I'll, try, to, I'll try to answer it. So, what, what, what we've done after offering many MOOCs on edX and Coursera is to do an internal request for proposals uh, in October at Columbia for flipping of courses and within three weeks, we had a very large number of applications from across discipline, across schools, and we awarded a number of awards to help faculty uh, flip their courses and for us to be able to assess the, 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 the learning from different types of, 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 of blended and hybrid learning. And we have just launched another RFP this spring, so this is a continuous process for us to actually capture data and, and experiment and learn from, from, um, from doing this. The, the early answer, the early hypothesis I have with regards to uh, disciplines that, that lend themselves to more flipping are fairly straightforward technology, engineering, and business, uh, where you actually can teach skills and train folks to learn a certain competency that then can be useful. Looking at MOOCs 2.0 or 3.0, in terms of low touch, that's really something that can remain low touch. And that's why when you look at edX and Coursera, you see that uh, specializations are being created when it comes to these two areas of engineering and, and business and where you have course sequences that actually lead to some mastery of topic. Uh, but for the other disciplines, uh, you really need that medium touch and, or high touch uh, that, that, um, that Kathy was alluding to when you have blended learning scenarios. Uh, but also I think what we have not talked about which is important mm -hmm. is beyond online learning or beyond online, which is once you have taken this MOOC, or have you taken a class? Can technology enable you to learn by doing? Um, and I have colleagues, for example, I have a colleague at the business school who is the head of our leadership uh, center, who after teaching a course on leadership, does very cool things with handheld devices that students for 12 months after taking the course have to actually apply the techniques they learned in class and respond to a community that actually auto-grades them. And there are lots of very interesting things that can happen after taking a course that can enhance the learning. Great, yes, why should the MOOC end exactly when you get to the end of the, it's just rather go against the spirit of the thing if you just put it away, doesn't it? And, uh, Jim, uh, the, yeah. I think the first question was about sort of corporate applicability, but anything that springs off that really. So uh, yeah, I'll answer that. I, I, I do wanna push us just a little bit to make sure we don't fall into the trap of, under, of thinking that the, the first minimum viable product, which is what these MOOCs are, is representative of what the capabilities are gonna be. Mm. And so one of the things I brought up when I first talked about it is, that frankly, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about a MOOC. We do not fundamentally know how to leverage the most available asset in 
our education systems, which is the other people trying to learn the same topic. And the opportunities for one-to-one -one group learning enabled by technology mean that the limitations of our current delivery model through MOOCs are, frankly, a uh, failure of our own imaginations to come up with new ways to actually create learning environments that can help tackle really complex subjects like history and some of the others. So we need to just really push ourselves to imagine what it would look like if you had communities of learners, some who are expert in some areas, helping others who were easily identified who needed assistance and vice versa. Um, so now I'll come back to the question uh, about the corporations. Yeah, I, I, one of the things that I actually failed, tr I tried to do and I failed to do was I had a nice consortium of the 300 largest employers in the U.S. and I tried to convince them to open up all of their non-proprietary online training content. I was able to convince some of them to do so. Um, and, and what they found was it actually provided, as you pointed out, like the one true economic value opportunity that MOOCs have, have created is recruiting, right? So I'll give you one example. There's a telecommunications company that opened up when in the initial part of their training to become a technician is an electronics course. They opened it up as a MOOC. Um, they allowed anyone to participate, beginning with their own employees, but then opened it up on the outside. And it gave them an insight into two things. One is um, interest, engagement, persistence, and ultimately aptitude to complete the work, right? Um, without, frankly, a really great design or any support. And then they decided, and what that did for them is it expanded the aperture of people that they normally would have seen with zero marginal cost for recruitment, almost 100-fold, literally. Think about that. Critical path hiring, increase your pipeline at zero cost 100 times. Identify high potential folks with no screening of your own zero marginal cost. Um, but at the same time, generate new people who think there's an opportunity that is available to them that they would not have thought was available to them before. So there is a tremendous amount for us to think about and learn and for employers to think about and learn from that kind of work in terms of in creating more inclusive workforces that don't rely on traditional credentials, that do open up the marketplace to people who demonstrate they can do the work, first through these courses and then through experiences and then through whatever else we need to figure out in order to make sure they actually wind up prepared and as a good fit. Was, yes, Kathy, did you want to quit? Yeah, I'd like that? to add another example to sure. that. Sure, um, that'd be great. That's, that's a um, professional learning program that, that we've developed internally that we're turning into sort of a MOOC-like um, experience. It's, uh, it uses badges and it uses community for Microsoft re retail employees around the world in a, a platform that we call the Expert Zone. And it's got lots of um, machine learning behind it that looks at what kind of incentives are needed to um, incentivize p employees to work together, solve problems, share their solutions, um, and help each other. And so within these systems, employees earn badges for required learning that they need to do, kind of the programmed, you know, structured learning, as well as the community-based learning that they do. Uh, it's been tremendously successful, we saw that. And so now we're um, converting our educator network. Millions of educators around the world are part of this open network. We've got millions of dollars invested in um, educator professional development content. So we're taking that expert zone platform with the badges and the community incentives, making that open, making that our educator platform and adding to it all of our um, professional development content. I would love to take a couple more questions and then we could sort of throw them around the panel to whoever seems most relevant or interested. Let's take lady at the front. There's another one at the front, so we need a, a sort of Usain Bolt sprint to the front of this lady here. Thank while, you. While you're sprinting. Um, that was of, nippy. One of, <laughs> Go on. one, one of the, uh, the, the things that we haven't talked about as an opportunity is the ability to embed, there's a lot of going to talk about the brain science and learning science. We haven't talked about the ability to embed in the design features and authoring tools of MOOCs, the practices that we know from learning sciences actually work, and in supporting the educators that are trying to create this new content to actually create content that comports with the best research. And that is a tremendous example. Have you got a quick well. example, really quick one that, that nails that? Uh, sure. So um, we actually know a fair amount about the power of worked examples. Um, and most professors actually mm -hmm. don't do it well. Well, if you build into the authoring system the place where they have to insert their work examples, 90% of the people are mm -hmm. going to fill it in. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, if you uh, build on the research that's available about how much video is actually helpful versus distracting, mm -hmm. um, then you will actually build a better visual product yeah, yeah. that actually has that's a higher point. likelihood of having impact. Those kind of things can be controlled. Very good point. Uh, yes, the lady at the front. Hi, uh, my name is Noor. I'm from Malaysia. So basically, I'm a doctoral uh, researcher doing on business model for MOOCs. So um, basically, um, this question is for Mr. Kanchani. So how do you see beyond MOOC? How do you would like to sustain the, um, uh, the users of using MOOC? Because right now, there are some uh, free uh, MOOC development going on. So, so in that sense, how are you going to cope with the uh, uh, with the augmented um, learning development that is going on when it comes to MOOC. Thank you. So is the, just for clarification, is the question, what is a sustainable yeah. path to, yeah. from a business model perspective? Yes. Um, what I may say may not uh, be very popular, so, but I will say it <laughs> anyway. I do think that, um, as I mentioned on the version 2.0 or 3.0 of the MOOCs, that these specializations that actually enable users to acquire skills can remain low touch for different universities, if that's the model, to invest in those. Uh, there needs to be some cost associated with these courses like we're seeing even with some of the platforms edX and Coursera. Uh, so I'm not talking about expensive costs to users. Uh, so it, would be, it has to be affordable with some financial aid model but that could be one way of making that segment sustainable. Another element, which is if these platforms work out two things. One, a licensing model for community colleges, for second and third tier universities and for universities around the world to extract parts of the content of the MOOCs, add content of the local instructor, and make that their course under their own le le learning management system, if they work out that licensing model and they work out the technology of establishing a standard of how you, you put content, and you know, there are many attempts by Google and edX to have standards like we have PDF or we have XML, have a standard that could be OLX of the standard content so that you can use it across, across platforms. If that is worked out, then universities across the world, the same way when I teach a course, I have a custom book and I pull chapters from four books plus my notes and that the custom book that students use and that the publishing industry has been able to s sort out a long time ago. If, 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 we, if the platforms, the MOOC platforms actually enable such extraction and unbundling and rebundling of content, that would actually make it for better blended learning. And then the third element, which I alluded to when I talked about not just teaching the world, but actually learning from the world, if universities start designing MOOCs with the idea that their own students are going to collaborate with students and learners around the world, then you don't need a business model because the business model already exists. These are courses that are part of the curriculum of universities, it's just that now, other learners from all over the world are, 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 are actually benefiting. So that's what I would call a medium touch learning for the students. So I see that as the three possible, and it's basically a mix of these three that, that's gonna, going to make MOOCs sustainable. Tom, did you want a quick word? Yeah, I mean, um, so, so we deal with a lot of um, research content, um, and we've been looking at ways to monetize it. And the thing that really is frustrating about the um, education industry is that we could just throw in adverts, right? And it would just pay for itself. Everyone would win. But for some reason, there's this kind of, it's just so taboo, you can't do it. But that would just, it would just be this big, open, free platform paid for by, you know, BMW or someone. It doesn't actually, I, I feel like there's this kind of, we need to get over this, um, a model that clearly works for online content and just accept that, you know, people might click on it and use that as a way to pay for things like MOOCs. Do you think that will happen or do you think what you describe as a taboo is, is I think very hard to budge? Who knows? I really hope that people kind of allow advertisers into the platform. I um, think that will be quite controversial and uh, uh, be quite interesting to hear what, you know, what people think about that. Nehru, you just wanted a, yeah, a word. Yeah, you know, um, so we built a platform that, excuse me, 
that people who create MOOC can actually just driving on your mic, I think, a little bit. I'm sorry. So um, we've created a platform that's, that allows you to customize stuff, allows you to build your own stuff. And it's completely free. It's just right for people using, who want to create MOOCs, can come in, uh, even though it's, sorry, even though it's for K-12. There's no limits to what you can do on it. You can create your own, you know, modules and then put it into the MOOC. And, and it's free. So, so are you suggesting there's no need for advertising then? I don't think there difficult? is, because there, there are, there are yeah. many people that are stop, stepping forward, the foundations, I mean, that's what we are. And we've spent a lot of money that we want people not to have to stop because they can't afford something. Right, non-profits or for profit, Jim? That, that's never been a question that's caused an argument before, has it? Yeah, I think, I think we need both. I think that, um, the reality is that the one thing that for-profits do extraordinarily well is scale. Mm. And uh, the other thing that they do well is advocate for what they think they need. So uh, I make this case in the U.S. all the time. When you look at the investment that we make at the federal level in R&D for medicine and health mm -hmm. or defense, um, it is literally 100 times what we invest in education. And, and then when I look across it, why that actually is, it is very, it, I have come to the conclusion that one of the big drivers is there are industries that lobby, excuse that word, that go to the government and say, we need you to invest money in R&D because this is how we make money. And there is no one who does that for education. And so when that begins to happen, um, investment in R&D will kick off. People will be able to raise capital, take things to massive scale. And it doesn't mean, like we're seeing in some of these other models that are emerging, um, and probably Tom can talk about this better than I can, that the end user winds up paying more than they're paying today. In fact, it can make it a better deal for them. Um, so we just so need to be thoughtful. So you're not in any way allergic to having that, that mix. Anyone on the panel Absolutely. to think differently, want to sort of give a squawk of pain? I mean, the other thing is, you know, for profits innovate. I mean, that's the thing that they really do very well, is they have the, the capital to, yeah, do R&D off their own back, whereas, you know, non-for-profit sometimes struggles with that, unless you have funding. And I, I would just... beginning to run against us, so what I'd love to do is just take any questions that we've still got, and then we'll go around the panel once, and the thing that you're bursting to say that didn't come up, you can save for that, that last round. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, sir, at the, at the back. Blue shirt, quick as you can. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Stephen Anderson. I'm an education consultant uh, in the United States. And, and I, so this $100,000 number is really bothering me, considering you're sitting next to one of the, the greatest platforms we have in K-12 and CK-12 and the, the textbooks that those students have, uh, have access to. Does that costing and spending that much money on a university level MOOC, doesn't that play into the argument that MOOCs will one day perhaps replace higher ed? Because a MOOC is seems to me could be relatively inexpensive to produce. And in North Carolina, the, the Friday Institute at the University at the North Carolina State University is creating MOOCs for teacher professional development that are low cost, that are no cost to schools and districts around the US and around the world, preparing teachers on data analysis in the classroom or literacy or, or helping them become better technology coaches. So it seems to me spending $100,000 or even $25,000 on course development plays right into the fact that MOOCs are gonna put higher ed out of business. Right, that, that hold that thought. Is there one other question that anyone would just really like to ask? Yes, we'll take this gentleman here and then we'll put them back to the panel the last round. Yes, thank you. I think on the, the same point with regard to um, reducing the cost of, of kind of producing MOOCs, one, one potential way is to, to open, up, uh, open it up as much as possible to allow, um, to allow anybody to kind of add content to those and innovate in a, in a, without kind of adding any cost. Um, I guess one of the risks, however, with doing that is that obviously if the content comes from Columbia University, you kind of, you trust that it has this kind of validity. But if we start opening it up, how, how do we know that the information that's coming out is actually kind of verified and whether you, you guys have any thoughts on that. Yes, that tension between it opening up and it being verifiable, authoritative. Oh, Kathy, why don't you take us away? 
Uh, take either question that you like, panel, but just try to have a, a, a mix so we get both dealt with. Kathy. Uh, so I think I, I want to address the question about a access and, and cost. Um, I think that one of the, um, the opportunities to reach m more people who probably need the experience is micro MOOCs and um, small bits of learning that are, that are openly available but um, can be accessed using a mobile device. And I think that people will make micro payments um, for those kinds of learning experiences or will subscribe to them, uh, potentially with a partnership through their telcos. There are lots of partnerships that are going on in education through telcos, and I think that's a potential sponsor. Um, yes, Tom. I mean, yeah, also on that, the publisher industry is going to change, right? You know, you're not going to buy a textbook anymore. You're going to buy maybe a page in a textbook. Just watch you on your mic there for people at the back. So, um, I don't know, yeah. Sorry, that, that was it. So yeah. th that it would be prone to the same changes that we're seeing in the textbook market. Absolutely, but also then you you still have whatever the the problem with reading anything online. You know, is it true or not? Who knows? Um, and, and actually, that's something quite close to what we do, which is about making sure people cite properly, because uh, that's the most important way, I guess, to actually show some form of validation. Um, and I think that's a much bigger piece, which is, yeah, what is the Wikipedia problem? You read it. Who knows if it's true? Roughly. Well, we were chatting on the way in, and, and you were talking about the, the, you know, how you, you are able to validate citations. You said there was a kind of an awful lot of citation out there that basically was rubbish or was just... Yeah. Great. I mean, roughly how much? So uh, Nature, the publisher, just released a, a paper, and it was something like 48% of all citations from last year were, were made up. University of Never Neverland. You know, just pe people, people have always made up stuff, but n on the internet it's even easier. Uh, so, so now it's time to start validating whatever it is you read. So uh, let, let, let me just try to address the two questions building on a comment from Tom. The clearest evidence we have currently is that MOOCs are not going to replace universities. They are going to replace textbooks. We are dealing with students who are not really reading textbooks before coming to class. And having high quality content in the way it is right now with MOOCs is actually attractive to students to learn the material before coming to class. Now, just to address the, the cost issue, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the cost does not take into account faculty time. So when talking about conversation of faculty, what I was talking about is video production staff time in terms of instructional design, and course assistants to build these massive banks of quizzes and exams so actually students can use them and test themselves. That actually does cost quite a bit of money because it's very, very staff intensive. Now, it's a one-time cost. It's not the, a cost that will be incurred each time the, the MOOC is rerun. But it is important cost because you need the kind of massive libraries of quizzes, questions, and Even learning objects. I'm just going to hurry you up a little bit because I'd like to just sure. to get around it, if you just want to finish that thought. Yeah, so, I, I, so that's why I'm saying I don't think the cost in itself is, 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 is too high or it's specific to Columbia, but a lot of staff time does take, does take place when you're producing a high-quality MOOC. Jim. So... Fundamentally, I just think we're actually asking the wrong question. The, the notion that we would be balking at the need to invest a half million dollars in a course that if it is actually the best in class would be amortized to cost millions of students seems very odd to me. And so it may be important for us to figure that out, but I think one of the things that we ought to be focused on instead is how do we dramatically improve the efficacy of these tools and resources what is the suite of things that need to be embedded in a MOOC for them to have a higher probability of efficacy? Mm. And then how do we begin to create an infrastructure that lets us learn more quickly from the betas that we create? Um, so I, I think doing that is gonna cost, at first, more than a half million dollars on the things that we care most about. But very quickly, the marginal cost of production will begin to drop to very near zero. So it's reassuringly expensive. Now, panel, uh, in our last couple of minutes, and I'm going to ask you to be very brief, so haiku-like, but I'm good, I, I saved uh, Nero because I wanted to, to come to you first on this. I'd just like you all to look into the next 10 years, if you could, and tell me how, tell us all, how you see the balance between digital, the MOOC, the post-MOOC, the schmook, or whatever it'll be by then, 
and face-to-face -face learning and the, the role of what used to be known as the human being. Uh, Nero, take us away. Well, the good news is I don't think we can get rid of the human being because uh, it's the human being that's really, um, you know, trying to educate the human being. So the tools, I mean, literally for me, uh, technology is a tool. And, you know, what we expect from it and what, you know, comes out of it is, is what we put into it. And unless we can perfect that, and that takes time anyways. So we have to keep re redoing these things to get to perfection. So 10 years from today, I, I, I think you will see younger kids at least, that's what I'm aiming for, will be still be being taught by their parents, their teachers, but in real time we can tell where they're going wrong using technology. Tom, you've been you know, sort of a, a bit on the cutting edge of the debate here today about how fast things could and should change. Do you think 10 years, that balance between the humor, human interaction and technology will look very different? Definitely, I, uh, yeah, brick and mortar, Education doesn't work for the sort of nearly 10 billion people we'll have on Earth by then. So it's going to have to be sort of a, a digital uh, learning experience. Um, and it can work. We, we already see it works. Uh, as I said, content on YouTube, people read Wikipedia all the time. And I, I want to access information. I think the way that we assess how people learn is, is the thing that will change. Um, exams, you know, how much can you cram in your head is, is slightly meaningless. I think it's more about how you interact and how you've actually learnt content, which is important. Um, and I think that's where we'll see the big change. And of course, MOOCs definitely help sort of going towards that. Kathy, will we still be talking about the MOOC in 10 years' mm -hmm. time? I don't think we'll use the word MOOC. Um, just as right now, when we use technology, there's similar um, ways that we use education. We have to think about what, what it is that we want to know or what we want to do, and we have to decide that there's something out there that will help us, and then we have to go find it and use it, figure out how to use it. I think soon we won't have that question with our devices. It'll just tell us what we need. It'll help give us suggestions. We won't need to know that there's a specific app. We won't even think about apps. We'll just think about what it is that we want to get done. In education, it will be the same way. We'll think about what it is that we want to get done. We'll find the thing that will help us to do that. Um, there may be teachers helping us to do that as well, but we won't necessarily think about where it's coming from or who created it. It will just help us to get something done. <laughs> I think the answer will be different uh, depending on the four segments I see in online education. Two years old to K, K-12, higher education, and lifelong learning. And I, don't, I think we have to treat these four segments differently because today you see two-year-olds who can use iPads better than their parents, and it's not clear whether it's good or not in terms of how the neurons get connected that actually uh, they can use technology at that young age. And I think the answer is we are going to become more and more challenged by the younger generation as they adopt technology and they expect more from technology. On the other hand, I'm very scared by the ADD of most of the students who cannot watch something for more than five minutes before without being on Facebook and social media, and how that is going to change learning, not only in classroom learning, but actually also learning online. And that's a very important question that we need to address. That's the Garden of Eden question, isn't it, really, about the technology. Jim, the last word goes to you. So I think, um, as everyone said, the likelihood that we're talking about MOOCs um, 10 years from now is, is almost zero. The reality is that we've already begun to see the spectrum of online learning play out. The big questions are gonna be, um, what does the interface look like between the humans and the technology? Both the people we call teachers today and the people we call students, I, I still believe that one of the things that, is, that we're gonna realize is most powerful about MOOCs is as platforms for enabling peer learning um, and creating community around it. Um, the, the, I think one of the really important things is not even just the facility at which our young children are uh, using technology now. It is the way they think about the formation of relationship. Uh, we feel the need to see each other. Um, they don't. And they feel just as close, just as attached, just as loyal, just pas as passionate, and just as able to lean on each other for help as we would, probably in many cases more. 
that dynamic and the role of technology in supporting that kind of set of relationships is going to be what allows us to think very differently about all kinds of learning and all kinds of development. Well, on that fascinating note, just uh, looking into the future, which we will not perhaps need to see each other as much, but still be connected. Um, let's go away and think about that. Thank you very much uh, for you all coming today, but most of all, our great panelists. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.